Hello everyone, this is Mr. Millette with an AP World History presentation. Today's presentation is all about networks of exchange in pre-modern world history. As we continue through our study of period one, the 1200 to 1450 period in pre-modern world history. Previously, we focused on the development, characteristics, and effects of the Silk Roads and the Indian Ocean complex. Today, we will return to a land-based network of exchange as we will study the Trans-Sahara trade route. Actively seek out comparisons in the reasons and enabling factors for the development of the Trans-Sahara trade and the Silk Roads and the Indian Ocean complex. Additionally, in learning the consequences of economic, cultural, technological, religious, intellectual, and biological exchanges made along the Trans-Sahara trade route, look for parallels and points of distinction with the consequences of the exchanges made on the Silk Roads and the Indian Ocean complex. By the end of this presentation, you will be expected to be able to demonstrate your understanding of these four learning objectives. One, explain the causes and effects of the growth of the Trans-Saharan trade route. Two, explain how the expansion of empires influenced trade and communication over time. Three, explain the intellectual and cultural effects of the various networks of exchange in Afro-Eurasia from 1200 to 1450. And four, explain the environmental effects of the various networks of exchange in Afro-Eurasia from 1200 to 1450. The Trans-Sahara trade route was a network of impermanent sand roads that were dependent on the Sahara sand storms, as many of the sand roads and human settlements were vulnerable to being erased by those sand storms. This risky travel was a spectacular human accomplishment as prior to the Foundations period and the establishment of early civilization in the Nile River Valley, traversing the Sahara Desert was nearly an impossibility. In fact, the Sahara Desert, as most deserts did in early human history, served as a buffer zone and a sort of natural barrier to defend Nile River Valley civilizations from invading nomads or rival civilizations' militaries. Much like the unforgiving terrain of Eurasia that the Silk Road traversed and the tempestuous waterways of the Indian Ocean complex, peoples living near the Sahara Desert found ways to beat the heat, the distance, and the dryness. Once travel across the Sahara Desert was established, it actually became common practice for travelers to traverse large increments of the desert. In fact, in many cases, it became common practice to traverse the entirety of the desert from the Mediterranean coast in North Africa to the cities and civilizations established in West Africa. One important city in Northeast Africa was Cairo, a city in modern-day Egypt. Many of the sand roads led into and out of Cairo, connecting the city to places in West Africa near the African savanna south of the desert. One important city in the West African savanna was Timbuktu in the modern nation of Mali. Like Cairo, sand roads led into and out of Timbuktu, connecting the city to places in North Africa. As a crow flies, the distance between Timbuktu and Cairo is nearly 2,400 miles. However, we have to realize that the nature of the sand roads of the Sahara Desert were not that direct. Sand roads tended to travel both east and west and north and south, and the uncertainty of the conditions of the roads and caravanseries made Trans-Saharan travel quite indirect at times. The Trans-Sahara trade route's earliest point of integration was likely during the foundation's period of early civilization. In fact, Egyptian merchants traveled south, typically along and on the Nile River, to Nubian civilizations as long ago as 3,500 years. As significant as that cross-cultural travel and exchange may have been to those two somewhat neighboring civilizations, the distance between the two paled in comparison to the distances that peoples of North Africa would travel by the late post-classical period. 
While Egypt may have been responsible for the navigation of a localized northeastern portion of the Sahara Desert, the Berber peoples of modern-day Morocco and Algeria were most responsible for the navigation of the western and central portions of the Sahara Desert. In fact, the Berbers may have arrived in northwest Africa as early as 12,000 years ago, prior to the Neolithic transition of southwest Asia and North Africa. Berber populations gradually migrated and established temporary settlements and ultimately became the earliest travelers of the Trans-Sahara trade route. By the classical period, both Greeks and Romans had traveled across the Mediterranean Sea and into North Africa, and many of their written records indicated the ample mobility of the peoples of North Africa. However, the late classical period, approximately during the 4th century CE, was when the greatest reaches of human travel across the desert truly began. What made this mobility possible, and what ultimately came from this mobility across the Sahara Desert? The role of technology, powerful states and trading cities, as in many other networks of economic and cultural exchange, made this mobility possible. And by the end of the post-classical period, Africa was integrated with Europe and Asia more so than ever before, and had become influenced economically and culturally by those Eurasian societies with which it integrated. Technology was a major contributing factor to the Trans-Sahara trade routes increased frequency of travel and exchange during the post-classical period. Like in the Silk Road, draft animals played a huge role in the ability for human mobility in the Sahara Desert. Donkeys and horses were utilized early in North Africa as transporters of light cargo, water, and cavalry units, but their endurance was short. The domesticated animal that enabled the greatest human mobility across the Sahara Desert was the dromedary, or the Arabian camel. The exact dates for the domestication of the Arabian camel are historically debatable. It is possible that the Arabian camel was domesticated as long ago as more than 3,000 years ago in southern Arabia in Southwest Asia. It is from the human interactions of Mesopotamian and Arabian peoples of Southwest Asia and Egyptian peoples of Northeast Africa that the Arabian camel was introduced into Egypt during the foundations period. However, it would not be until the late classical period during the fourth century CE or nearly 1700 years ago that the Arabian camel was moving people and product across the Sahara Desert. That occurred once the Arabian camel was introduced into the Berber populations of the central and western portions of the Sahara Desert. This special animal was heralded for its endurance and ability to cover great distance with very little rest and maintenance. The Arabian camel could average traveling 30 miles per day in the unforgiving conditions of the Sahara Desert. The Arabian camel is a hydrant animal, which means it has the ability to retain water in its body, as it does not perspire much when it is working and traveling. The Arabian camel is recognizable with its single hump on its back, and that hump helps to store the necessary water. When Arabian camels do hydrate after several days of work and travel, a single camel can consume as much as 30 gallons of water in less than 15 minutes. This heavy and sometimes spastic beast of burden becomes quite docile once broken, and actually shows and expects affection from its handler. Keep in mind that these camels were going to be traveling between 40 and 60 days across the desert, depending on their points of departure and their destinations. Additionally, these camels had the capacity to carry more than 400 pounds of cargo each, so these animals were definitely built to go. Travelers typically moved within large camel caravans across the Sahara Desert. Those caravans typically included approximately 500 camels, but in some points of the post-classical period, camel caravans included up to 12,000 camels. As Arab, Berber, and Egyptian peoples produced saddles, 
specially produced for the Arabian camel, Trans-Sahara travel advanced even more. The rate by which economic, cultural, and technological exchanges happened in Africa during the post-classical period was certainly owed to the Arabian camel and the human ingenuity that went into the capitalizing on its muscle power and natural physical attributes. Another contributing factor to the Trans-Sahara trade and it becoming such a highly trafficked maritime network of exchange was due to the emergence and maintained existence of strong kingdoms and empires in West Africa and North Africa. Though no single empire controlled the entirety of the Sahara Desert at any point in the post-classical period, strong kingdoms and empires did emerge in their respective regions of Africa. Finally, some societies in Africa achieved the levels of state and empire development. These kingdoms and empires in North and West Africa were integrated by this lucrative system of economic and cultural exchange, and as much as those kingdoms and empires contributed to that system, the system also contributed to their own political stability and economic prosperity. In North Africa, the establishment of Arab Muslim empires was a major contributing factor to the increased frequency of travel and exchange across the Sahara Desert. As Arab peoples moved from Southwest Asia into North Africa during the post-classical period, they brought with them their draft animals, technologies, languages, and religion. Additionally, Arab peoples brought their demands for scarce resources that were more prominent in West Africa. The first Arab Muslim empire to establish itself in North Africa was the Umayyad Caliphate between 651 and 750 CE. Though centralized out of Damascus in Southwest Asia, North Africa was a very important region of the Umayyad Caliphate. That importance was embedded in the Umayyad's zeal for spreading Islam and its propensity to gain wealth from conquered peoples and territories. The first Umayyad caravans of merchants, missionaries, and soldiers encountered Berber tribes and other Saharan peoples. Through those interactions, the Umayyad became quite aware of Africa's valuable resources. In the regions of the desert that the Umayyad Caliphate could extend its tribute system, the empire would acquire these valuables by imperial expansion. In places far enough from the Umayyad reach, like in the Southern Sahara and Savannah regions of West Africa, the Umayyad Caliphate would receive these valuables through establishing trade relations. After a century of Umayyad rule, the second Arab Muslim empire to retain control over North Africa was the Abbasid Caliphate from 758 to 1258 CE. The caliphate was centralized at Baghdad in Southwest Asia, but like the Umayyad Caliphate, the Abbasids recognized the financial benefit of retaining North African lands. It would be during the time of the Abbasid Caliphate that the lucrative trade would drastically increase across the Sahara. Additionally, it was during the Abbasid Caliphate when the seemingly one-way direction of religious diffusion occurred as Islam became the popular religion of the kingdoms and empires of West Africa. In West Africa, the Sudanic states and empires emerged to the west of the Kanem-Bornu Empire and the Hausa kingdoms. It is in this region of sub-Sahara Africa where the most prominent and prosperous states were built before 1500. One of the earliest Sudanic states of West Africa was the Kingdom of Ghana. Between the 8th and the 13th centuries, the Kingdom of Ghana was the wealthiest and most powerful of the West African states. Arab Muslim merchants from North Africa made their way across the Sahara Desert and began to make commercial exchanges with the people of the Kingdom of Ghana. And as early as the 10th century, the kings of Ghana had converted to Islam. Reigning over parts of the contemporary African nations of Mali, Mauritania, and Senegal, the Kingdom of Ghana was a major supplier of gold to Arab Muslim merchants. 
In fact, gold was exchanged pound for pound with salt that was introduced to Ghana from Arab Muslim merchants who peddled salt from the salt mines of North Africa. In the savanna of Sudanic West Africa, salt was a limited resource, but salt did exist in abundance to the north in the Sahara Desert. In the desert, salt mining towns emerged and became the supplier of salt to both the West African kingdoms, like Ghana, and the North African empires, like the Abbasid Caliphate. Arab Muslim merchants got to these salt mining towns and ultimately got their hands on the salt in the Sahara Desert, and that salt served as their key that unlocked the gates to the West African kingdoms. Salt mining towns such as Tagaza and Taudani in the northern part of the current nation of Mali were the most productive towns that Arab Muslim merchants traveled to and peddled salt into West Africa. This was where the camels came in most handy, as salt slabs extracted from the mines weighed approximately 200 pounds each. In essence, a single Arabian camel was capable of carrying two salt slabs on its back. Imagine then a caravan of 500 or even 12,000 carrying between 200,000 and 4,800,000 pounds of salt into West Africa, only to load up an equal amount of gold dust and gold nuggets and make the trek back north. Salt mining was difficult and dangerous work and was typically done by slaves. Oftentimes, Arab Muslim slave merchants would receive non-Muslim slaves from the West African kingdoms in exchange for salt and other scarce resources from the Mediterranean region. Though many African slaves did make their way to slave markets on the North African coast and were sold into domestic servitude into Southern European and Southwest Asian civilizations, many West African slaves were merely transported to the salt mining towns of the Sahara Desert. The Kingdom of Ghana gained enormous wealth from its contribution of West African slaves to Arab Muslim merchants, as it had also gained enormous wealth from its role in the gold trade. The Kingdom of Ghana's most impressive city was its capital at Kumba Saleh, which in the 10th century was heralded by Muslim travelers as a wealthy city with a gold-studded palace that was the residence of the wealthiest people on earth. Later, in the 13th century, as the Kingdom of Ghana declined, many of its people and territories were absorbed into a nearby emerging Sudanic Empire. That Sudanic Empire was the Malian Empire. During the 13th century, the largest and most prosperous empire in West Africa was the Malian Empire. Established by Sundiata, the Lion Prince, the Malian Empire grew to absorb the peoples and territories of contemporary African nations such as Mali, Mauritania, Senegal, Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. Historically, it is unclear exactly when the Malian kings converted to Islam, as there exists conflicting historical sources as to Sundiata's personal religion. However, it is historically documented that Sundiata's grandson, Mansa Musa, was a devout Muslim who sponsored Islam and was responsible for its popularity in most of West Africa. Mansa Musa invited Muslim scholars, such as Ibn Battuta, to encourage the development of proper religious practices, Quranic studies, and Sharia legal practices. He also sponsored the building of mosques and Islamic schools. Mansa Musa also led one of the most well-known pilgrimages in the history of the world when he led more than 60,000 people on the Hajj to Mecca. On his way to Mecca, Mansa Musa visited Cairo in Egypt and bestowed on the marketplaces and peoples of Cairo an immense amount of Malian gold. In fact, his gifting of the gold was so great that it actually devalued Cairo's currency and inflated the prices of crops and goods in the marketplace. Mansa Musa was extremely wealthy 
due to Mali's control of the gold trade in the 14th century. The gold trade involved two processes of extracting gold from the West African environment. First, gold panning was done in the Senegal and Niger rivers in West Africa. The second method was mining, which also occurred near the Senegal and Niger rivers, which existed in the southern portions of the Malian Empire. Mining for gold was difficult and dangerous work, as many West African slaves were utilized in deep gold mine shafts that were vulnerable to rainfall since the shafts were close enough to the tropical zone. That rainfall poured rainwater and loose dirt into the narrow mine shafts, where slaves and laborers drowned and suffocated. Like its predecessor, the Kingdom of Ghana, Mali benefited from the Trans-Sahara trade route with the Arab Muslims to the north. Mali's elaborate bureaucracy, tributary system, and prosperous cities, such as Gao, Janay, and Timbuktu, guaranteed the continuous accumulation of wealth until its demise in the late 15th century. The trade cities of North and West Africa were extremely influential in the increase of travel and exchange across the Sahara Desert. In North Africa, cities like Tunis in modern-day Tunisia and Cairo in modern-day Egypt provided large marketplaces for the exchange of gold, salt, ivory, and slaves to other Mediterranean societies of Southwest Asia and Southern Europe. In West Africa, cities like Gao, Janay, and Timbuktu, all in modern-day Mali, were also instrumental in the exchange of those resources. However, the mobility of those goods and the caravans of people and animals that carried those goods would have been impossible without the existence of oasis towns throughout the Sahara Desert. Oasis towns were established at necessary points throughout the Sahara Desert so that camels could rehydrate, merchants and other travelers could eat and rest, and that the caravan leaders could solidify their location, upcoming weather conditions, and plan their expected times of arrival to their next destination. Examples of these oasis towns were Ajila, Gadamas, and Kufra, all located in the modern nation of Libya. These oasis towns provided lodging, food such as date palms, and water, all things necessary for the continuous movement of the caravans. In effect, travel and exchange along the Trans-Sahara trade route led to the expansion of market economies, such as Muslim bazaars in oasis towns and trading cities. Additionally, the trade route enabled the rise and maintenance of strong states and empires in West and North Africa. The Trans-Sahara trade route also led to the integration of African societies with Mediterranean societies of Southwest Asia and Southern Europe. This in turn allowed for great economic prosperity in North and West African societies. This integration led to a greater coexistence of Arab, Berber, and West African peoples with the diffusion of Islam throughout North and West Africa. In these regions, the construction of mosques and schools would alter the urban and cultural landscapes of African societies. Lastly, the Trans-Sahara trade route would lead to an intensification of African slave trading. African slave trading would not remain isolated to pockets of Africa, but was expanded via the Trans-Sahara trade route. This intensified slave trade of post-classical period would be extended even more in terms of geography and volume after 1450, with the arrival of Europeans in the West African coast. Once again, what sort of parallels can you draw between the Trans-Sahara trade and the Silk Roads, between the Trans-Sahara trade and the Indian Ocean complex? Consider the overlaps in religious, economic, cultural, and linguistic effects of these networks of exchange on Afro-Eurasian peoples. Consider the roles that empires, states, and cities played in facilitating exchanges along these networks. Do you see some similarities? 
the pre-modern world was characterized by extensive multi-regional networks of exchange, and the rate and volume of those exchanges, in spite of arduous terrains and long distances, helped to progress cultural development prior to 1450. And the Transara trade route, along with the Silk Roads and the Indian Ocean Complex, were the world's earliest and most impactful networks of exchange.